Yeah, he's on right there. I'd like to call to order the July 13th, 2017 meeting of the Strategic Planning Committee. Um, if everyone would please rise for the invocation and pledge, the invocation to be given tonight by Councilman Oliver Joseph. Bow on here. Dear Lord, give us the power and strength on this committee to make the right decision for this my parish. And the Lord bless this great state, this great parish, and this great county. Lord, also bless all the armed forces service members that uh, give us the right to free speech. And bless all the members in Maryland. Thank you. Good Thank you, Good evening. Evening. To, to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What's up, Dan? Um, Madam Secretary, let, let the um, roll call show that all five members of this committee are present. No one's absent. Uh, item number three, public comment period. Um, anyone wishing to speak tonight uh, on any item on the agenda? There are only two. Please come forward and um, we will accept your, uh, your speaker's card and recognize you when the time comes. Item number four is the approval of the May 11th, 2017 strategic planning uh, minutes. The chair will entertain a motion. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Cagnolotti, second by Mr. Lawler to accept the uh, May 11th uh, meetings. Any discussion? Any objection? Hearing none, that motion carries. Um, items five and six, before we get into that, um, I've had a request by uh, Mr. Founier, our planning director, that we reverse the order of those, and I've spoke to the uh, individuals, both individuals involved, and, and neither uh, object to that. The reason for doing this is that um, our engineering review agency consult consultant who will be talking on improvement of the LDCs on the drainage impact studies, which is currently six, we're going to move it to five, unless this committee objects as a commitment um, in a matter of actually of minutes. Uh, and I apologize to that uh, to you, Mr. Sanji, and so forth. The recreation meeting ran a little over that we didn't think it, that that would happen. So does anybody in the committee have a problem with reversing the items uh, five and six? No, no. Okay, I don't believe we need a motion or anything for that. We'll just go ahead and do it. So item number five now does become improvement of the LDCs, drainage impact studies. Um, Ms. Mr. Sanji, if we can get you to come up to the microphone and while you're doing that, a, a quick, a very quick history because of his time frame. Um, we had we had asked um, the administration, I guess, two meetings ago because we didn't have a quorum last time, that um, and we had a discussion at that time too that that perhaps the drainage impact studies, maybe not as bad as the traffic impact studies, um, the comment them being not, uh, the latter not being worth the paper they're written on, but certainly probably could stand some improvement. So we've dis we discussed a lot of things about retention ponds, uh, the detention ponds, and the difference between the two. We discussed about maybe going to a 25-year uh, storm plan instead of uh, the 10 that we're using, different things like that, and gave the charge to Mr. Sanji to come back, looking at Appendix 5 of our Unified Land Development Code, and let us know what things we might could change or, or not change, or is everything copacetic. So that's where we are tonight. Um, uh, Mr. Founier, maybe you want to make an introductory remark? I will. I, I just want to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Sanji of CSRS, our en engineering review agency, who's going to give address the uh, the issue. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Founier. Mr. Sanji, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate the change in schedule. Um, since the last meeting, there was quite a bit of discussion about uh, Phil and the impact that it was having, uh, or at least certainly the perception that it was having uh, about drainage. And, and following that meeting, uh, Mr. Pugne organized, uh, Sean and I came and some of his staff and actually rode around and looked at several subdivisions where there were uh, what, you, what you would consider significant amounts of fill, five and six feet, uh, to see, you know, our reaction to those, how they were constructed, and whether or not they were causing problems. The answer to that is that, that uh, you know, some were, and, and in my opinion, some were not. Um, the, the, one of the, the bigger issues is that as the higher the fill gets, the, the more space is needed from that elevated building pad to the adjoining property, because you've not only got to slope the fill and maintain it, but you need an interceptor ditch between the new development and the existing property. And that ditch has to have a slope to it and it has to be maintained. So in some cases, uh, you know, maybe the, the inspection 
could have been better when the subdivision was constructed. Maybe it was constructed fine, fine and since that time there's been some siltation and whatnot. But again, the placement of the fill mandates you know, more and more ditches. And again, the, the parish is already uh, backed up with those requirements. So, you know, in, in itself, anything can be engineered properly. Uh, and I really don't think that was the, the, the issue so much as really just the, the maintenance uh, or again, possibly the, the lack of inspection maybe during construction. Um, so I did want to follow up at least to let you know that as a staff, we have looked at that um, and prepared to discuss that further. Um, on the fill limitation, you know, I, I don't think you can refuse to allow someone to develop because they may need more than three or whatever nominal number of, of fill that, that you want to allow, but you could begin to start looking at a certain amount of fill or limiting the amount of fill and then the, the remaining height would have to be addressed with piers or you know a pier and beam type construction instead of a slab you have to elevate your road you have to get your road within one foot uh, of hundred year otherwise if people can't get in well what good does it do um, so you're, you're gonna have fill no matter what um, and um, my, my point in this is that whatever consideration is made it's gonna have to be thought out and it's gonna have to be thought out extensively from a lot of different angles. Um, but I do think that a combination of fill and piers could be, uh, could be a solution that we could look at. We're not yet prepared to say, is there a, you know, a magic number? Um, switching gears a little bit, we obviously had the, the big storm and rain event of last August. Uh, if you remember the council, uh, because of the uncertainty of the inundation levels and the fact that, that the ordinance required you to construct one foot above record inundation uh, negated that, that particular clause of the, or, uh, the ordinance. Since that time, uh, our firm has done an uh, inundation study. We've mapped that, presented it uh, to the council. Uh, so that data is out there and available. And I, I do believe that one of the things that should be looked at would be going back and reinstating that the greatest differential, I believe, was around a foot or a foot and a half. There were two or three pockets where the, the record inundation was about a foot and a half above the 100-year. So the question becomes, do you want to allow people to build uh, to the FEMA 100-year knowing that that's flooded before? Uh, my suggestion is no, you, 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 you should look at it again. Um, and I understand at the time the reasoning. Uh, but some time has gone by, and I, and I think at some point uh, that should be looked at again. A lot of communities are beginning to look at regional detention systems. Um, having a pond on, in every subdivision is certainly not the most efficient way to do anything. It's like anything else. If I can do one big one, it can make it much more efficient than uh, having a lot of smaller ones. Um, and, and although the detention ponds do their job, guess what? You've got to dig dirt out to create them, and that dirt creates fill, and that fill, again, is used to fill the lots, and that's part of the, you know, the perception problem of, of, of what you're seeing is that if there's a drainage problem and the neighbor sees fill, then right away they're thinking the fill is the cause of the problem. Um, so regional detention is, is a something I think Houston probably has the best models for that uh, they their and their fees are pretty steep in, in what they what they charge for the development of land but they take that money as opposed to going to a general fund and they spend it specifically on a regional constructing a regional detention system so um, that's a very expensive and very complicated uh, process. Calcasieu is beginning to look at that. I mentioned that before. Uh, but certainly that's something you could put on the radar screen. Um, Councilman Satterley mentioned uh, the detention systems on a 10-year going to 25. Um, yes, that would create more storage. 
would also create more dirt. Uh, yes, it would help, no doubt about it. But again, every, every increase is going to have some, some consequences on the other side. If you went to a 25-year, Sean and I talked about this this morning, you, you'd have to take these weirs and look at the design of these weirs at, at smaller storms events, like a two, five, ten-year event, because if you design it for a 25 and a smaller event comes, you actually end up really not detaining much water on those smaller rain events. And, and the smaller rain events are the ones that, you know, are happening more frequent, and you may be getting just as many calls about those. Um, so if we went to that 25-year, uh, we would probably institute a, a really a greater level of calculation, probably a little more sophistication in these weir structures uh, where they're typically right now designing them just for a 10-year event. We also look at the 100-year event to say what happens if you get, you know, the big rain event. We want to make sure that water is going to get out before it, it, it damages a, a structure. Um, I think that's pretty much touching on everything. I'll be happy to answer a few questions. Um, all of these are just simply concepts. I think, I think you know, if the, if the committee or the council want us to look at the specifics of, of these recommendations, then, then we can certainly take them and, and look at them to a higher level. I would suggest that we spend some time analyzing them. We spend some time uh, talking to the, the uh, engineers that represent the developers and talking about the consequence if we're going to make a change. I think we should all be in agreement that, it, that it's going to make a positive, uh, you know, a, a positive effect uh, to the parish. So. so I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yep. Thank you, Mr. S uh, Sanjay. I'll go ahead and kick the ball off and, and sir, stay as long as you can um, without having any problems. Sure. Um, I've captured about a dozen different bullet points. Excellent. And I want to thank you for going out, um, yourself and Mr. Fumier and whoever else went with you to look at all these subdivisions where you said that as much as five or six feet are there and, and, and for being frank and honest that sometimes that yes is a problem and sometimes it's not. Uh, as you segued into your other com uh, comments, I did start three or four that I'd like to talk about and we'll turn it over to the rest of the commission here tonight, um, excuse me, uh, committee. You said that um, basically you don't believe that we could refuse to allow uh, someone to develop if they need to bring more and more fill in. Um, and I and, uh, kind of promised Mr. Fournier, and we can bring him up to the mic if he wants to, to preface this and if it puts you on the spot. Um, I do realize your firm is um, competing on the um, RF um, P, uh, Q out there, I guess, for the floodplain management study that may one day hopefully lead to floodplain management ordinance. And I did assure Mr. Fournier at least in my mind, unless it's in the minds of my fellow uh, committee members, this was more about just cha changing drainage uh, impact study code than it was to get into the area that, that it seems the drainage commission is tackling floodplain management. Okay. But you are not, by that statement, in any way saying that, that we do not need floodplain management study and that, mm -hmm. and that we, we could use that, and, um, and I don't think that compromises you you're competing for those monies, and, no, and, and, and that we could therefore one day get to floodplain management a law changes. Right. Let, let me clarify what I was trying to say. I don't think you can tell a person he can't develop his property. So if you tell him the fill restriction is three feet, then his solution is, okay, I'll fill three feet, and I'm going to I'm going to build elevate the remaining three feet with piers. He's got a fee. You, you can't deny him a solution. Right. Is my only point. I understand. Okay. That solution may be a mixture of fill and piers, and I say that because homeowner may not want to buy a house that's six feet on piers, right? It's a lot of steps. But he might be willing to buy something two to three feet that might have two or three feet of fill and then two or three feet of... Uh, so my only point was was not arguing to do it or not. It's just that that there are other ways to accomplish height than fill, and it, the answer may be some combination of the two. Okay, appreciate the clarity there. Um, you also talked about, um, you said, uh, you, you would, I'm not sure you said you'd recommend it right now. Um, I haven't heard anything as strong as a recommendation, but that you believe we might have to elevate roads to the one to one foot of the 100 year. Um, can you maybe elaborate just a little bit on, on that? Yeah, I mean, right. people keep telling me that it, the roads in Ascension Parish essentially act as levees, and they keep the water from moving from yep. point X to across that street to point Y. Sure. Um, last night, for example, uh, and this particularly bothers me, um, our commission 
approved a development on Highway 73, and the complaint about, uh, well, we actually had a commissioner kind of sort of playing your job, a drainage engineer, by saying, I looked at the BFE. And the BFE of this development uh, is less than the adjacent subdivision, when this case happens to be Longwood. And so we all know water flows from higher to lower, and so therefore, actually, this water is going to help the drainage because it's going to flow over. What I don't think he was considering, however, in playing engineer, is that when you fill that property up with asphalt and the homes and the streets and the five businesses, so, or, or not homes in this case, but businesses and so forth, that that water table, so to speak, has no, the water has nowhere to go now. It may, may backflow because when it gets up against Highway 73, there's that levee I was right. talking about that's going to keep it maybe from crossing over. And in fact, I find it kind of interesting because the engineers on that project, with the approval of our staff, says, okay, we need this big, huge pond up there in the front, besides Bayou Goo being uh, a, a retention pond. And so I think right there, that's an admission that the water that normally would be coming there needs to be held for a little bit after a rain event, because as I understand your, your definition in the past, when you uh, schooled us on retention versus detention ponds, is that you, you want to retain it for a little bit and then let it go when the rain stops and this sort of thing. So how about elevating roads to one foot? So the ordinance says you, your road must be built to within one foot of the BFE. Now, that depending on the natural grade of the land, you may have to fill to get it there, and you may not have to fill. You might be able to cut it down if it's, if it's outside of the floodplain. What we're, what we're simply, the reason that is in there is that you don't want a road that's four feet below the 100 year and you get a big storm and people can't get to their home. So the, the, where that is coming from is houses are built one foot above, roads are built one foot below, so you have about a two foot differential between the road and the home. That's, that's where that comes. But that does not start to specify or even address whether or not you can fill or not fill a road. That right. would have to be an additional consideration. Right. All right. And then um, number three, regional ponds. And I'm about to turn this over. Um, um, you made the comment, and I hope I'm not misquoting you, that you believe it's more efficient than a lot of small ponds. Um, I'll go on record right now to tell you I've done a little of my own personal research, and I've rapidly became a fan of regional ponds. Um, in fact, uh, I've met with some folks who asked me to remain anonymous right now, and I've asked them to come before this committee because I don't believe in such things, but don't for whatever the reason they don't want to. I can assure you they're pretty professional, and they're telling me, look at St. Tammany. They're doing already some pioneer work there, and it's working nice for them. Uh, you happen to mention, too, it's a good segue to, I believe you said Houston uh, with regional detention. Um, I, ca I captured that. Uh, the fees with that, of course, are steep. The fellow I've been talking to says, yes, they are, but they work, and they're worth it in the long run. Um, um, you know, uh, is that something you think down the line that, that, that CSRS is going to be willing to recommend to us um, instead of just individual ponds? Because one of the issues that was brought up by the gentleman I spoke to, he said, quite frankly, Doc, he says, look, these ponds – are sort of like the roads that this parish takes into its parish maintenance system once the <coughs> developer, developer walks and you, you know, you get past this year and then the transportation committee, um, and this is not a knock of just an inherited problem that, that my colleague, Mr. Right. Lawler, has gotten. They're taken in, and we don't have the money to, to maintain them now. So now we take these ponds in, or you might say the POA does, when there's even a POA that does it. Right. But regardless, Nobody does anything with them, and they get silted in. And we've heard testimony recently from citizens that are angry, saying that they use this to ride around in their right. P roads and their boats and their fish in and so forth. And the idea, unless it's a dry pond, and the guy I talked to was similar to the comment you made last time, you can never really get it down to be dry. But the point is it's never low enough when the rain event comes, especially when you have rain on multiple consecutive days of, of significant inches each day, to where they don't do what they're designed to do. However, regional ponds, apparently, from what I understand, do better. So Well, you, you're going to have a public am, am entity. Am I crazy maintain. here? Or? Well, you're, they're going to be built bigger. They're going to be built deeper. Uh, you're going to have a public entity maintaining them. So there's several reasons. I, and, 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 and on that, by the way, excuse me interrupting, I discussed with him that was the big thing. I said, so who's going to take care of that? We can't even take care of the other one. He goes, oh, there's plenty of ways. And believe it or not, he said, look to Houston. Uh, of which that steepness is there, but you can find the ways yeah. to fund this and keep it going and, and keep the people from flooding. So I would answer your question that, that I think 
it would be very prudent to do some research where this has been instituted and to be able to come back and tell you, you know, the, the, the pros and, and We even had discussions on, you know, whether it's located next to a, 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 a waterway that would be taking the water off, what he called three-sided versus four-sided mm -hmm. ponds and stuff like that and differences, and that was just, it was fascinating to hear some of the engineering behind it. It sounds they're, pretty high-tech. They're, because of Houston soil and rain events, they're probably the leaders in the industry. So. Okay. Uh, and my last one, and we turn it over to the committee, 10-year detention systems. You're talking about going to 25, something I brought up last time. I, I captured, you said, yes, it will help create more storage, but that's, of course, going to require, understandably so, I guess, more fill, um, and therefore require the engineers, both on the uh, developer side and then our guys checking them, uh, which is you guys um, it, with the ERA, uh, greater levels of calculations in doing these drainage impact studies if we go to... Uh, to 25. Um, did I get that right? You did. Okay. You I'm done. You did that um, very well. So. And we'll start maybe this way and go that way. Mr. Joseph. My question is with the fill and the uh, piers, what you're saying it might be one of the options. And, and, you know, from your looking at this program and everything, you know, a lot of people do not want to go to the pier, you know, program, Understood. you know, and to to try to beat that or try to get that through them will be hard. How, how would you, I mean, we just implement a rule that they do it? A, a developer is going to have to construct every home in that subdivision the exact same way. You can't have a mixture. So that's why I'm, it sounds good, okay? But you need a lot of public input, um, and you're going to need a lot of education, and this is going to require a lot of consideration before I would recommend that you do it. I'm saying it is an option for you. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, to get this acceptable to builders, a whole different story. And, you know? and, and excuse me for interrupting, Mr. Joseph, and it helps greatly on insurance, doesn't it? When you mix uh, the fill with the piers, because like I'm in well, Slidell, and the <clears> difference <throat> between the, the FEMA lift that I just experienced, yeah. going up 14 I'm and a half above uh, uh, Grade, I'm which is one foot above BFE, my insurance dropped from like eight thousand well, dollars down to three hundred and eighty something. If dollars. you accomplish the same with Phil and it's uh, one foot above, I, I'm not sure the insurance is different. Uh, but well, I can find that out. Okay, that's the only. Question. I sure would like to know that. Okay. Because, uh, yeah. Sorry, Mr. Joseph, I interrupted no, you. But that's it. That's good. That's the biggest concern I have. Um, Councilman Johnson. Michael, I guess a lot of what you're saying. What we do today is based off of the ordinance that we have in place. Yes. So the dreaded word of study with <laughs> the floodplain management that we're talking about doing in order to make these changes to our development code would have to be studied to find out exactly how do we change from where we are and what we're doing today to doing the uh, the general retention ponds for areas uh, which which I've been arguing for for years to try to get some some footing on getting that happening I think it's a it's a better way of going but so am I right is that the only way we're going to get from where we are today is to come up with a study to base well, our efforts off of to make sure we're going in the right direction or not I think some of these ideas could could be looked at without that study and some of them I think part as I understand the study they want to look at all the individual basins and model them and understand them better and you know sometimes maybe it's a different set of regulations for one basin and, an, and a different right. basin depending upon how it's behaving uh, we had that same discussion about uh, watersheds in East Baton Rouge Parish this morning so um, I think some things could be done without the study I think some things should be done with the study it just depends what you're considering. Because th there are different types of retention ponds and areas in the sense that you have dry retention ponds where there are some retention yes. ponds and areas that uh, they do recreation in. Right. And whenever they have a ma major rain event, those re recreation areas be fields, baseball, football, soccer, whatever, they go into water until the event is over with, and then they, after that they're draining Correct. off natural time frame, and then they become recreational fields again. And there are also some other... Uh, retention ponds that are turned into recreational facilities for fishing or what have you and, and boating and those type of things. Uh, <clears throat> I guess part of the, in, in your opinion, do we have parts of the parish that 
every right now we're all about this, the subsurface drainage and this, that, and the other. You get into some of the lower lying areas of the parish. If we start, even if we're building them up, we do subsurface drainage. We're not accomplishing a lot. Do we need to think outside of the box and develop our, our, our ordinances to where we're more flexible in a sense that some areas we will allow open ditches and other right. areas that we will require subsurface drainage uh, to mm -hmm. manage our drainage issues. That's an excellent thought and question. What I learned from the storm in August, and you look at the inundation, and the, which was basically the southeastern strip of the parish becoming a, a floodway for the overflow of the levee on the Amy River. That area is behaving very, very, very differently than the northwestern part of the parish that's on much higher ground. So you can't, to, to try to have a set of regulations for the entirety of the parish, when you hydraulically they're behaving very, very different and they're subject to, to, to different types of events, that's, where, that's what this study will allow you to do, to look at what are the true behaviors of the different watersheds and the events, and therefore you craft your regulations around the watershed and not try to craft them around a political boundary, which is what we've done, which is what all parishes do. So, but I think you're going to see more and more trend of drainage regulations being, being developed specific to a waterway. So in that regard, wouldn't the same principle be applied or could be applied to the residential developments as, as, as opposed to if we're in certain areas, we're not going to allow you to build up. We're going to make you put it on piles that, and, and so forth. And in other areas, we will allow you to build up X amount and then go back and, and have to That's do, correct. you know, like you talked about, there may be some areas where you do partial partial uh, fill and partial piles and some areas you can, you can do total fill, but it's all about the retention for the general area or that floodplain management, how you're going to manage within that floodplain, correct? That's correct. It's and so as opposed to digging, having the, uh, to bring in the fill and do the retention on that particular site and whatever it costs the developers, that cost could be transferred into a regional retention pond that they would buy into there, which could hopefully either be expanded or dug deeper at the time whenever they're there. The difference is, is that it's getting their water from their development to the, wherever that retention pond is would, right. would probably be the, the major consideration as far as uh, getting the, uh, the, the cost, I guess, for the developer into those regional retention systems. Would that be accurate? It is. I mean, they're spending money to build these ponds now. Don't get me wrong. But you can't have them develop here and, and the detention systems in the watershed two over. Right. Obviously, that's not going to do any good. But... Conceptually, they would be spending the money on a regional system as opposed to spending it on constructing it directly on their own property. So. Thank you. Uh, one other question from Mr. Jerome. I don't, I don't know if you were able to, to find any information. Now, we had a conversation a few weeks back after one of our council member meetings where a gentleman made a comment to the fact that having houses up on piles doesn't positively affect the insurance rating. Have you been able to find anything out towards that? I have, that? a little bit. And uh, before I answer that, I want to apologize. Michael has to leave. We had promised him he could leave at 7 o'clock, and he ended up having to stay a little bit over. Yeah, and I, can I make I a comment apologize. about that for yeah. the councilmen that haven't spoken yet? Sure. Um, it'd be all right, Michael, if they send you their uh, questions or whatever via email. Yes. Okay. And I will also say, uh, just touched on several topics, but happy to come back and no, we're we're not going to solve this tonight. We're going to no, have you back. No, and uh, yeah. much further discussion. I just wanted to give out some food for thought and, and continue the discussion. I'll thank drop my, my questions off to your house tonight around midnight. Don't That'd worry. Thank, <laughs> thank, thank you for coming. And, and hold I'll, Councilman Lala too back. I'll be right behind him. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Jerome, go thank ahead. Thank you. That's quite all right. Uh, Councilman Johnson, yeah, I, I did look into that. And uh, let, let me back up a little bit and kind of just from from elementary standpoint. You know, when, when subdivisions are built and we're putting in fill, typically if they're in the A or the AE flood zone, we're, they're fl filing for what's called the LOMER-F, which is a LOMER's letter of map revision, dash F, meaning it's, it's being revised because of fill. When properties are in that subdivision, they're basically exempt from having flood insurance from the, F, uh, from the flood insurance program, right? So because they're filled, they're up above the base flood elevation, they're no longer required to have insurance. 
On the other hand, lenders, whoever, the banks, might require them to have insurance. Property owners that go to the same elevation with peers are required to have insurance, right? So they're not exempt from the insurance policy, but if the insurance, if the, there's insurance on both houses, one with fill, one on peers, the insurance rate's pr pretty much the same, and it's much cheaper if they're up above that elevation. One, you can exempt yourself from the insurance, the other you can't, all right? So that's that's the basis, that's what I've been looking at, and I'll get, get a little bit more information for you on that, but that's my understanding. I wanted to talk too a little about, about the regional uh, detention basin that you had brought up earlier that Michael's discussing as well. Um, one of the things, when you look at the, the flood insurance program, uh, I forget what number it is or what letter it is, but we get a 10% discount on our insurance, flood insurance, for Ascension Parish residents. And we get that 10% discount because of some of the things that we have implemented in the program. Um, outreach programs, things of this sort. Uh, having our base flood elevation at a certain level, we get a discount on our insurance. If you look at all the point systems that the feds put together for our flood insurance, one of the biggest points that you get as a, as a community is having a regional detention basin, all right? So it's up, it's major. If there's a regional detention plan and you put a regional detention basin together, you get some major points in, in, uh, in terms of reducing your flood insurance. Um, I'm trying to get some figures on that. I'm trying to discuss it with some of the people of the state right now. So, you know, this has been an ongoing discussion. I want to I want to continue that. You know, so. But um, I hope that answered a little bit of your question. Yeah, yeah so one, one other thing that, that Michael brought up before he left, the, the roads, as I understand it in our code right now, the reason that we bring them up to a foot above base flood elevation is because that's in the code. But it's not a requirement, is it's, it? It's other a than foot, what we put in there. It's a foot below base <coughs> flood, foot flood below, elevation. I'm sorry. Right, yeah. It is a requirement, and it is in the code. Um, the, I, I would say that before we make any changes in that, we get some good engineering explanation as to why that change might occur. Right, but uh, but right now it's a foot below base flow elevation. But it's it's our it's our code. I mean, if we wanted to it change is. it to two feet below, we could do that. We could do that. Yes. And I mean, I think one of the things that I would like to see us look at within that is, like was brought up earlier, a lot of the roads in here do turn out to be levees. Yep. And we don't have enough yep. cross drainage in those those roadways to to make it to the point of where they, they aren't the levees that they become. Yeah, one of, one of the big <coughs> levees we had in the last flood was a railroad track. Right. Quite honestly, you know. And, and we're not going to be able to touch those for mo for the most yeah. part. I mean, they're, they're very specific about what they let us do over there. But yeah. as far as is there, could we theoretically in these developments go through and identify roads that uh, obviously. You want to be careful what you do with it because you want, like, like Michael said, you're going to wind up blocking people from getting in and out of their homes. But as far as whether or not we require, continue to require the roads, or can we set up a category of where we say X road will be at a foot below or Y road will be at two foot below or so forth and so right. on. And, and then also while we, when we get to those elevations on those specific roads, have something that tell us how much surface area we're going to have to have underneath that to allow the water to go across yeah. it. Yeah, I think we through. certainly can, but, you know, as, as Michael's describing, too, one of the things we need to look at is a geographic perspective in terms of drainage in the parish. You know, right. certain areas, Prairieville, as an example, is totally different than portions of Santa Ma, you know, and so let's look at that particularly within those areas and those parameters, and I think that we can come up with something, and hopefully that study that's out for bid right now um, it will be able to help us address some of those things. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mr. Lawler, are you, are you willing, Jerome, to stay on? Sure, his, I can stay as his, late his as you hot, need. His hot seat? No, I don't have a... I have dinner. a different set of expertise here, but, but I'm enjoying yeah, the discussion. Now, Let's continue. And, and be honest with you, I, I can't answer some of the hydrologic and engineering understand. questions. Yeah, you are on record uh, saying that you're not an engineer. I'm, not, not, planning an, director. I'm not an you engineer, got, got exactly. Uh, Aaron Lawler. And I wasn't going to ask you any of those questions. Um, <laughs> okay. First of all, I just want to make a statement maybe to everybody in the parish. We're talking about you can be exempt from flood insurance if you're high enough and you, you have some fill, or you can you know not be exempt. Nobody in the parish should be without flood insurance. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. 
I'm not selling flood insurance. I don't. Yeah. I don't make any money off of it, but I'm just telling you now, I, I don't would, be without flood insurance. <laughs> I would totally agree with you. Wait, did yeah. you just admit you don't take your own medicine? <laughs> no, no, I'm saying I don't sell flood insurance. Oh, I thought you said you didn't have flood insurance. No, no, oh, no. no. T- okay. Always had it. Um, I have a question. You, I don't know if you can answer this. It's more of a curiosity. When we talk about regional detention ponds, approximately what size would we look at for like a Prairieville area or – are we talking like 200 acres, 50 acres? I have no idea. All the above. Yeah, and that that would go under a hydrologic study when looking at the drainage pattern, uh, the amount of rainfall that would fall on a particular geographic area, looking at the the way it's draining into certain basins, you know, to make that determination. So I, I really, I really okay. don't know the answer to that. I mean, if you look at um, our our map, you can go online. And it describes the different, you can click on one of our GIS programs and it will show you the different drainage basins within the parish. So you can look at those. Some of the drainage basins are much smaller than others. You know? So within those areas, I'm sure that that particular um, area uh, that we're talking about would be much smaller than others. You know? um, one of the other questions, uh, one of the statements that Mr. Sanjay brought up was, some of the issue that we may have had or some of the issues that we may have had in the past was lack of inspection or quality inspection during the construction phase. Um, it is, does that mean we have a lack of inspectors or they're overworked? Or do you know anything about his statement there? Well, and that could be part of the planning yeah. for us. That's why, that's why well, we have subdivision inspectors and we go out on a daily basis and we're monitoring uh, the construction phase of the projects. And so we, we're on the, on the field. We can always use more help with that, but we, we're doing an adequate job on that. Okay, I mean, that's what I was going to add. Is it something yeah. y'all need more help in? Is it something that that would... We can I, certainly... I don't want there to be problems, and then later right. on find out, say, hey, you know, we really could have used more people. We just right. weren't being able right. to do the inspections. I'm in discussion with administration right now on how to how to upgrade our inspection, southern inspection, especially get it computerized, get the pads out there with yes. some of the people and everything else. So we're in that discussion right now. And I can report back to you on that. Okay, good. So, I mean, I think that's and, very and, positive. And just, right? just today, in fact, I had a discussion with uh, Mr. Dawson, and we're talking about getting our building inspectors really up to speed and trained on looking at up home elevations and how we're raising houses in certain portions of the parish. We need to get them trained on how to do the inspections for those type things, and um, we're, we're going to go through that program right now as well. Okay, and I remember yeah. you and I were talking about the, the pads for the yeah. inspectors. I mean, that's the 21st century. we got to get in yeah. that. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, when it comes to the pads, one of the things that we're looking at is that the first time a, a person will come out and ask for a permit is when an electric pole's installed in site and start the construction. So that's the first time we actually go out to a site. So if somebody's built up a pad three feet or four feet or five feet, we don't know about it unless we're riding around, we see it, and they could just be piling dirt there for, for a year before they even pull a permit. We won't know it until that permit's been pulled. So what we're trying to do right now is monitor that a little bit closer. And once the building inspector goes out there for the electrical pole, we want to know what height is that pad right now. That's something we're trying to institute right now as well. Okay. I'm going to email the rest of my questions, Mr. Yeah. Sanji. I'll sure. put you on the spot. Um, l- let me do a follow-up right, right then, and we're going to get to um, Councilman Cagnolotti, uh, as, as a, unless the group wants a second round. A follow-up to what he just said to me would be, and I kind of asked it to Mr. Sanji, but he, he probably better to answer this one. Who, if anyone, is maintaining and inspecting detention ponds right now every time we approve a development? Because we rarely approve one where, where it doesn't involve a detention pond after they do a hydrological hydrological we, study. Yeah. I mean, how do we know they're not getting silted in so that when we do need them to do what the mathematical calculations said they would do, right. uh, yeah. that they're doing it? Well, number one, when, when, a, when, a, when a contractor goes out and the developer goes out and actually uh, gets his project approved, we, we approve a set of construction plans. So there's two portions of this. One is the SWIP plan, which is a, a stormwater retention plan that we have. And that's part of the program where they're trying to monitor the amount of silt that's going out into the ditches. You see those small little black fences that are around construction sites? Mm -hmm. That's part of the SWIP plan. And we're requiring them to maintain those SWIP 
programs. And uh, typically developers hire a subcontractor to do that. We, we're monitoring those. We have a person on staff, not my staff, but it's DPW who's monitoring those SWIP plans. In addition to that, we're also having our subdivision inspectors, and those subdivision inspectors are going out during the construction of the project. They're looking at the plans. They're looking at everything. Once the project's been completed, we have one final inspection that we do before that plat goes before the Planning Commission for approval, and it's the final inspection. We determine whether the depth of the pond's accurate. We uh, determine um, you know, that the roads are constructed properly, the drainage is constructed properly. So we have that, that final inspection. So all the course of the construction, we have people monitoring those things. Um, uh, one of our subject inspectors is out there um, hopefully at least two, maybe three times a week looking at the different sites. Okay, and, and, and Jerome, that sounds fine, but I, I guess my question, went, or maybe I didn't phrase it well, it goes a little further. So what happens, though, years later to ensure that the ponds are not now silting in? Just from normal wear and tear use, and so to speak, and all of flood events yeah. and things that go on. So it's wonderful that, we, we, that we're checking on them to be sure it's the right depth, as you said, and the right slope to the size and right. gallons right. and capacity and all that. But how do we know three, four, five years after a subdivision is built that that pond is still functioning the way it was originally engineered, designed to function? Well, we turn that over to our drainage department. They're the ones who are monitoring that. Are, are they monitoring that? Oh. I don't, I don't know the answer. So the question is for Mr. Rue. Yeah, yeah. We'd have to ask Mr. Rue about Thank that. Thank you for your, uh, candid, um, your candid response. Mr. Cagnolotti. A uh, couple of points and then a kind of a statement. Uh, Mike made note that developers are sometimes forced to use field to raise streets, roads in right. the development. Right. And uh, in, in most cases, in order to get to and from, in and out, access and egress. If she should have a high water flood event, right. they, they need to be able to evacuate, and that's that's a problem. Um, the other one is that I heard discussions about how different we are across the parish. Clareville being much higher, prior, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Santa Mall, southeast part of the parish. Donaldsonville right. is actually high yeah. uh, compared to the to the East Bank. A lot of areas of the East Bank. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind, I think that it's it's safe to say, and I, I think we we should get quite a few answers to questions once this floodplain management program is established mm -hmm. and we have a real good picture of what the parish mm -hmm. is, what we have now. Right. But I agree with his statement that a lot of, you know, research, yeah. I hate to use that word study, huh, Denny? <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of research needs to take place yeah. so that yeah. we don't do this uh, yeah. in error and have to come back <clears throat> and say, hey, we, we messed up, we got to do it again. And the other thing is, it's 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 hard to say that parish wide we're going to do something that's going to be an ordinance for everybody in the parish, right? And we're going to have to word those ordinances if they become that very carefully, so that it's, to lack of a better word, regionalized or, or right. you know, within certain flood zones and who right. has to react to what, right? So that, that's all. Yeah, I, I agree with that, I, and I, that's why I mentioned that we need to look at the parish geographically mm -hmm. and look at the different areas of the parish because they do act differently hydrologically. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take the liberty of ending the discussion here tonight, uh, both due to the late hour and, and in deference to our next speaker who was kind enough to be switched. And just, again, uh, welcome the two commissioners that didn't get uh, Councilman to speak to directly to Mr. Sanjay if you could do that by email. Yeah. And as a result, bring this back at least one more time and then get to a point to maybe or maybe more than once to, to where we can either say we're going to accept the status quo or we're going to move forward with some recommendation to the full council. Is okay. that fair enough? I mean, okay, very fine then. And uh, we'll before be, we do we'll that, though, in, in, that. in fairness to the public, we do have one public uh, speaker on the subject. Um, I have a card from Mr. Jeff Pettit. Jeff, if you'd step forward, sir. Thank you, Doc. Sorry I was late, but uh, I had to address one thing that uh, Mr. Sanji said, and um, I listened closely to what he had to say. Uh, his comment that um, during the flood in August, uh, the Amy River levee 
bank whatever overflowed. Well, I gotta tell you something. I live on Corner View between Gonzales and Geismer. All right. I started taking water in my house August 10th, okay? Not the 11th. I started taking water in my home August 10th around 1130. My grandson woke me up. At 430 that morning, with almost two feet of water in the house, we left. Bayou Francois backed up. New River backed up. Smith Bayou backed up. It had nowhere to go. It had nothing to do with a meet. Santa Mall was not underwater at, on August 11th at 4.30 in the morning. I went underwater on August 10th before midnight. So uh, if, if we do this hydrology study, just I'm, I'm asking y'all, please, please ensure that we get a proper report and not just another paper that collects dust that the taxpayers pay for. Because what he said was not correct, or he doesn't have all the information. I've got respect for CSRS, but don't tell me that a meat overflowed and caused my house to flood, because that is not what happened. That's my only thing. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, and thank you, Mr. Pettit. Um, okay. Um, Item number six now is the, uh, which was scheduled for five, as everyone knows, the presentation to Restore Act, uh, 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 Restore Act of Small Business Loans uh, tonight from the South Central Planning and Development Commission. Um, we have Mr. Cullen Curol. Uh, it says on his business, is that pronounced that correct, sir? Curol. Curol. So you're a Curol to all our problems? Uh, and you're going to help mm, us to, <laughs> certainly you're going to help the small business guys get a, a, a real nice loan. It says uh, on his card he's a JD, is that Juris Doctor? Mm -hmm. So you're an attorney, and your title is the Regional Economic Development Administrator. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. We welcome you tonight, sir, and look forward to hearing what you have to well, say. Thank you very much. I'd like to first start by complimenting this group because I, I'm a former member of the Lafouche Parish Planning Commission, and, and again, in the good old days of the 80s and even in the early teens, it was, you know, easy to just be doing subdivisions and not all of the other things that I've heard discussed here today. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that y'all are talking about a, a strategic or a drainage, and you're right, the word study is, is got to find another one. But again, it's encouraging <laughs> that y'all are doing this. Mr. Curell, do you have a recommendation? <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to be funny. What we, could, what we could substitute for the word study because it is an <laughs> ugly word in this parish. I, I don't know. I, I, no, I don't have one, but if I come up with one, I will let Please, you know. Please, you've got my email. The, um, again, and, and continuing that, uh, a parish-wide uh, process is, is, a, you know, is a good thing. I would also mention that the same programs, the federal money that is funding this uh, Restore Louisiana Fund is also working on regional uh, drainage efforts. Pat Forbes with the Office of Community Development might mm -hmm. be someone that y'all either have already had here and or should in the future. Um, I work for a regional planning commission, and so to me, the word regional is something bigger than a single parish. And, and hydrology, as was said earlier in the discussion, hydrology doesn't know the parish lines. So, I mean, it's encouraging that we're talking about regional drainage um, the parish-wide plan will be tremendously beneficial, but I would hope that you would continue and coordinate and work with the state efforts. Uh, they have picked three or four basins around the state to begin. Again, their term regional means multi-parish, basin-wide studies. Right. And, and I think AMEET is, is one of them, and so to me, Partner with them. Do what you are going to do here within the parish, but work with that state effort. Would you, Mr. Carroll, give Mr. Forbes's um, 
a title again and who's he with? Office of Community Development Disaster Recovery Unit. I can get it to you. I yeah, don't just wanna send, please send me that because okay. I mean, if, if anybody wants to chip in, we, we always want to hear about that. Well, okay, uh, I'll go with that. I don't mean just that. financially. Again, I, I mean in any kind of possible way. Uh, mm -hmm. All kinds of things have value. As I understand, they've because of the uh, uh, the the vastness of the disaster, they can't do every basin that was impacted. This right. program is 51 parishes across the state, uh, but they've chosen one in the Washita area. They've chosen one in Acadiana, and I believe the Amit is the third of these first studies. But uh, you can't hear a dog if it don't bark. So <laughs> there we go. We may, we might want to. That, a little bit. Well, that, uh, you know, that are really taking the same look at what y'all are talking about, but of course from an area perspective that is much broader than the parish. So uh, let's take advantage of what is happening, and, and there's a lot more broader, wiser thinking going on, like I said, than, than we knew we needed to way back when. Um, so let me, let me back up again and, and, and start mentioning what I am here for. My name again is Cullen Curall with South Central Planning. South Central Planning is a regional planning district. We cover the parishes of Assumption, Lafourche, Terrebonne, St. James, St. John, St. Charles, and St. Mary. Uh, so what am I doing here? Well, the idea is that because of where we are, we have handled lending programs since Hurricane Andrew. Uh, we did it again in Katrina Rita uh, South Central Planning did fisheries programs, helping fishermen, uh, small business programs. Uh, we helped to distribute 60 to $75 million of Katrina dollars to businesses. Mm -hmm. We did a scale down program for Gustav Ike. Uh, I'm doing work in St. John Parish, Hurricane Isaac. And we've been invited and we've been offered uh, to a, a contract basically to help the state distribute some funds uh, relative to the Restore Louisiana program, again related to last year's floods. <coughs> the program is related to both the March flood and the August flood. What they've done is they, from a federal standpoint, they've combined the disasters. Y'all hear a lot of advertising about Restore Louisiana. It has been, um, I want to say it's a couple of billion dollar program. Well, what they've, and it's been for housing. Um, I can't speak to the housing piece. I have not been a part of it. But what they've done is they've taken about $51 million aside and decided that they also need to have a program to help small businesses that were impacted by these same events. Uh, again, they've, they've carved the state into 51 eligible parishes. Ascension is, I believe, one of the bigger impacted parishes uh, by, by dollars. Uh, and so we, South Central, we, you know, we, we made a decision. Only St. James was in the 51 parishes. But the irony is three of the five intermediaries that were asked to help distribute this money were not in the area, and it's just because we're in Hurricane Alley. We, we were, you know, our experience came from past storms. But we, South Central, have basically decided that we're going to work this program for the state. We've opened opened offices in Lake Charles, Lafayette, Baker, Denham, and here in Gonzales. And so my purpose today is to let you, but more than letting you, it's it, it's let you help me to find these businesses because the program has been in place since May 26th, and we don't have a lot of participation. I will speak to you know there being a need for more advertisement, more public awareness, and that's basically what I'm here for. The, um, the opportunity is there. We're talking about a 0% interest loan. That's pretty good. 20 to 50,000, but technically we can go up to 150 if the business can demonstrate that need. Um, there are a host of, re of requirements, and you know, to me, the, the brochure is here for you to look at. We have a website. The state has even more information. Um, it is federal money, so I say paperwork and patience. We're, we're gonna, it will be uh, a little time consuming to qualify. But again, 0% interest for five years. And oh, by the way, if you pay your bill, because this is long, grant, well, they're not using the word grant. They've used the word grant in the past. This time, They've, they've chosen not to say grant, but it's a forgivable loan. And what that will mean is we're going to amortize 80%. Uh, 
um, at the zero, you know, zero percent interest, eighty percent of that amount, and assuming you pay your bill, uh, the last twenty percent will be forgiven. Wow. So uh, it, it's it's a grant on the tail end as opposed to a grant on the front end, which is how the prior programs had worked. Either way, it's a great deal. You yeah. know, I'll, I'll use the example of the fifty thousand. You 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 get fifty thousand in your pocket. You pay forty back, and it's done. And you're paying this forty back at zero percent interest. So it's it's that's uh, the term free money has been said. I, I don't know if that's a technically legally correct term, but again, it's a good deal. So I I ask your help in finding these businesses because what we are experiencing is fatigue. Businesses have had to, in order to survive, they've run up credit cards, they've gone to the bank, they've borrowed, they've dealt with lower revenues. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're still here. They're glad to have survived, but it's it's a tough time. And we mention the word loan, and and they just don't want to talk to us. Um, they've also had, you know, bad experiences, and I don't want to. Um, I don't want to speak bad about what other people call a four-letter word, and that's SBA. Uh, again, SBA has helped a lot of people, but there are also a lot of businesses that were not able to get SBA assistance. This program is designed very specifically to work around the SBA requirements in that we still have to consider duplication of benefits, and we can't pay you for something that SBA has already funded you for. But again, we're not paying you to rebuild your physical building. We're going to try to, if you're eligible, we're going to calculate your award based on working capital going forward. Everybody has working capital going forward, and it's easy to, you know, it's easy to do the accounting on the tail end. We don't have to worry about Davis-Bacon. We don't have to worry about a lot of the federal requirements that make federal lending problematic. So we are, we are happy as, as a planning district, and, and by the way, I, I know you all are familiar with your, our sister agency is Capital Region Planning Commission, so just again, yeah. if I hadn't explained that. Uh, we're happy to be working with them to bring this program into this region. Uh, so how, so how, do you, how does a business become eligible? They have to demonstrate 10,000 out of pocket in physical damage, which means, you know, you had $100,000 of damage, but the insurance or SBA paid for 95. Well, you know, no, you're not eligible. But if they paid for 85, yes, you've got your 10 out of pocket. Um, or, and it's an or, because many people think, oh, I didn't have water in my building, so I'm not eligible. And that's wrong. It's not only physical damage. You can be eligible if you can demonstrate a 20% decline in revenue. Uh, 20% is simply calculated 2015 compared to 2016. If that doesn't work out for you because many businesses are seasonal or just had, you know, uh, unique circumstances, we can sit there and compare quarters. Um, that secondary calculation might take a little bit longer, but again, paperwork and patience, and, and this is a tremendous opportunity. So I would basically implore you to help us find these businesses. Um, other things that you must have, um, one employee, one to 50 employees. Um, you must be either open for business in these 51 parishes or can demonstrate that you could reopen. Some of your, you know, your businesses haven't reopened yet. So they are not uneligible. They are, in fact, still eligible if they can demonstrate that they could, with this assistance, reopen. Um, Again, I don't, um, I, I'm looking at the basics, and I, I think I've gone over this, so I, I would like to open the door to questions, if yes, that were. Uh, I, I have a couple. Mr. Kiro, and again, I want to thank you for coming. This sounds almost too good to be true. Can, um, can I interrupt with that? Yes. That is what we're hearing. That is, we are absolutely hearing, you know, the, the fatigue with SBA, the fatigue with some of the other programs, and the fact that they say it's too good to be true, they think we're a scam. But we're not a scam. I, I, and it's, well, I can it's assure amazing. You, I it can is assure amazing. you I vetted you. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't be standing in front of this committee, sir, so it's not a scam. And we, again, we appreciate it. Uh, question number one would be, um, you mentioned that, um, that Ascension, of course, is eligible. In fact, you have an office you said in Gonzales. Correct. Could you tell the people that may be watching on uh, 
Channel 21, whatever, uh, street address and perhaps 20, phone number? 2010 South Burnside. Um, 2010 South Burnside. Correct, here in Gonzales. The yeah. phone number, 800-630-3791. Uh, and then we also have a website, scpdc.org. Okay. Um, Say that one again, S -S -S No, the, if you think about the initials of South Central Planning Development Commission, it's scpdc.org. All right, got it. And so um, uh, the state also has the websites that will point you to ours, but we, um, the planning district, have our own. Um, that 800 number is good for uh, business owners, even if you're not in uh, Gonzales. Uh, we Can you repeat it one more time? 800-630-3791. And, and if you know, some of us have websites and so forth, and we'd love to help you with this. So if we put this on our website, you wouldn't mind in any... Not at all. It's my understanding. And, and look, I'm going <laughs> to throw the thank yous back at you because right. uh, no, no one problem. of our staffers have already... Um, basically, there's something running on the little TV channel no, We thank here. you because if, if people avail themselves to this and, they, and this is just the one you said that are out of business come back in, obviously they're taxable again, and that's mm -hmm. an important consideration for this council. Um, are there any purposes that are off limits? Um, you mentioned damages and stuff like that. Like they can't use this money to, for example, I don't know, pay off credit card debt that they have? or Technically, the answer is no, they cannot. But again, what we're doing is we're creating a circumstance, and that's why I think it's a great program. If I agree to pay you six months of your working capital, well, you were going to spend that money anyhow. You were going to use your revenue and your savings to pay those bills. And so now you can take that money that you were going to otherwise use, if not for these funds, to do what you want with it. Because it will, you know, we will have given you what you needed for your working capital and or your inventory. We can, you know, movable equipment, we can reimburse you for movable equipment that you've not been able to replace and or that you have replaced uh, a, re a repair, you can repair it. So again, the idea is um, to, to get around, you know, the Davis-Bacon, the construction problems and all of that stuff. We're basically going to come up with an award uh, for working capital so you take your otherwise working capital money and do these things that you might need to do right now. Right. Questions from any committee members? Um, we'll, we started over there. We'll go this time over here. Mr. Cagnolotti. Thank you. Uh, Colin, just quickly, are y'all contacting local chambers? I mean, I know that's the, the yes. probably the primary business community representation in an area, and I know we have a very strong chamber here. Yes. They would I, probably love to hear about your program if they I haven't have, already. I have presented, um, well, let's see. I have presented to Denim. Uh, some of our staff has been to the uh, Ascension Chamber, yes. Um, we're, we're probably on our second round. I guess that's where I'll go with that one. We, we've contacted chambers. We've asked them to do email blasts. You know, mm -hmm. we have these documents mm -hmm. electronically. And so to the degree that anybody has an email list, we can uh, make the information available that way. And we have been working with the chamber. The answer is yes. Having been involved with them and, and, and a current member, they have allowed elected officials to be members. I recommend get with Sherry and see if you can get on her agenda one month. Okay. Uh, they'll allot you a few minutes and you can get mm -hmm. up and make a, a summary presentation. But it's a great program. And uh, one other thing is I see that uh, you're you're funded by HUD, Community Development Block Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, program is being attacked, as you know, on the yes, federal sir, level. Yes, sir, I understand. And uh, I'm going to do everything in my power to help uh, to encourage the, the Parish Council of Ascension to uh, come up with a resolution in the near future. I mean, it's okay for this fiscal year, but I understand next year it could be in severe jeopardy. So, uh, or maybe even this year, some of it. I, I don't know. I, th I think it's next year. I think they've approved the funding for the end of this fiscal year, but going mm -hmm. going forward, the funding for sure. this program is already in place. Mm -hmm. it, it's we're not, you know, in past programs, as I said, we did Katrina, we did Andrew, Katrina, Rita, Gustav, Ike, right. uh, Isaac. We, you were always waiting for those dollars to arrive. It's my understanding that the dollars are here. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get people to put in the application, yeah, I might take 30, 60 days, which I know is longer than going to a bank. But uh, again, it's, it's the program, in my opinion, understanding. There's no bank that'll do this. <laughs> well, the, no. the program, in my opinion, is being run much more efficiently than past programs. And I know that's hard to say when you hear the people who are not right. satisfied or not getting what they feel they want, but 
I am very impressed with this program. I think it's an opportunity. Uh, if people can, you know, just just give us give us a few hours of your time, and I say that I say it that way. Come and sit with us. You can you can look online. You can see the application. It's it's long. Oh my God, it's it's a pain in the behind. But it is a long application. Fill out what you can, and then come sit with the staff, and we'll explain the rest. You know, there it is. It is still federal money, and so there are some federalese in there that, yeah, we we need to explain to you. Uh, the application is also lengthy because we're asked. We're basically asking you to tell your story. A lot of the application is simply text boxes. There's not a wrong answer. Just tell us your story. Uh, if you tell us your story, then we have staff that are pretty pretty good at maximizing what your benefit can be. So again, it's not like you know the the, the box. We're not we're we're somewhere out of the box, and I think that's a good thing for the businesses that have not in the you know prior to now gotten their assistance. I want to mention one more thing. I heard the uh, Recreation Committee and the discussion of 501c3s. 501c3s are eligible. Oh. Mm -hmm. Now again, they have to have the one employee. And one hurdle that I have to mention is there is an expectation, anybody that gets an award will have to sign a personal guarantee, 20% owners of in any business. From a nonprofit perspective, yeah, it's problematic getting a board member to sign a personal guarantee. So a nonprofit that otherwise qualifies will have to find some mechanism of collateral. Again, we can be flexible in what that is, but again, you know, the idea is that there, there, there should be some mechanism to uh, collateralize the award. Um, and, and, and when we're calculating it from an underwriting perspective, we are not counting donations, and I'll say fees. We are count, we're looking at earned income. So it's the, it's the I would say recreation district, but it sounds like it's the league that ha that runs the concessions. It's those concession dollars that will be counted to ca to calculate whether it can be repaid. So it's it's a little bit harder, but there. Hey, I know a lot of nonprofits back home where you've got fire district. That which is government, and then nonprofits sitting question. on the How side. How the volunteer fire department fit into that? Because all the ones we have around here are private corporations with their 501c3s. As long as they have an employee and earned income, they are in fact a business from this mm -hmm. for the purposes so. of this program. So would, would groups like Cara be able to do a little bit of that? I'm not familiar with that one. They're a 501c3 that has a contract <coughs> agreement with the parish to um, they're, they're concerned animals. Um, they are earning that degree? Uh, that that Cara, compensation. Um, what is the acronym? It's totally. It's I mean, if they're they're running a shelter, they're doing something for yeah, their they, money. They, they so that is earned they, income. They do adoption. They do. Um, they, they, my they my don't, point is, they do everything but our bite cases. They got a cooperative endeavor agreement with the parish. With the parish. The we they're, pay them a certain amount, and then they, they gain other income by you know fundraisers, right. volunteer. So so, so if if they can show in their books how much of their income is for that service that they provide, that they get paid for. And That's I apologize for my, my brain slip. It's um, Companion Animal Rescue of Ascension. Okay. Did I get it? Okay. But again, the answer is if they have an employee, at least one employee, yeah, they, do. They, have had the, they, they have to show the, the physical damage or revenue loss. Um, and again, we're calculating. Even if, the, even if the parish has helped them restore some of their facilities? and That would be, that would reduce their physical loss. So again, if you had 100000 in physical loss. But if they could demonstrate to you that they lost more than the parish was willing to replace the when the 10000 out because of Because we, we, for example, own the building. The parish does. Mm -hmm. And um, part of the cooperative endeavor agreement that um, Councilman Joseph just, um, Johnson just mentioned is in addition to a, a payment, which I believe is something like $200,000 a year, they get use of the building that the parish owns and so forth. But the building was severely damaged. It went underwater. Well, I don't know if they would be able to count the building because that was a parish's building. But if they could, if mm -hmm. they if they had equipment, that, again, it's it's all you know. Think it from a corporation standpoint. They are a corporation, even though they are nonprofit. Yeah, they, they may have, have lost some income. of their equipment. I, I mean, I don't know none of the details, but have them come sit with us. I think that's the smart thing to do. I might just mention it to them and tell them to go talk to you because mm -hmm. never any harm in talking. And, and that's kind of the, the deal is we've got pretty good staff sitting there waiting for people to come in. You're going to come in and we'll sit with you. I'm told sometimes it's an hour or two to explain the program because it's, it is, it is you know, hey, I, I don't want to be the headline of a paper that says we've done something wrong. Right, so gotcha. everything is everything is audited and um, 
but but we can figure out how to make something right. work. Uh, Councilman Lawler, I believe, has a question. Yes. yes. Are there special regulations for businesses run out of the home? Uh, they're basically they'll follow the same set of rules. But what we will do is, um, for instance, you know, your office in your home. Uh, again, we're gonna we're gonna do as the IRS would do. I'm not going to count your electric bill 100%. I would do as you do in your taxes. I will count a, a percentage yeah. of, uh, again, trying to use the same calculation that you do in your taxes. Yeah. Every, your every, um, everybody's got to turn in their taxes. Right. With nonprofits, it gets a little different. If you don't have 990s, we're going to need to see something. We're going to need to see financials. We can even do churches. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we did one with the Hurricane Isaac money. And oh my God, we scrutinized that file because we were not going to pay for the repair of the steeple or the pews. But we literally took the footprint of the building and carved out where they did classes. They had all kinds of you know, social programs and they earned so service monies for doing these tasks. It can happen. It did happen, again, a few miles over in Laplace. Uh, but, but we will, I, I promise you, it'll be scrutinized a lot more. Uh, right. I mean, literally, we took footprint of the building and, and, and did all of that stuff uh, to make sure that we were not paying for religious activities. M but Mr. again, Johnson. it's all doable. Maybe the cap on all. Um, You're happy. Well, again, we thank you. Um, uh, I'm just in love with your name, Gerald, um, for coming here tonight. And uh, we'll certainly spread the word uh, from this committee and, and as much as we possibly can. And I wish you every, every bit of luck with, with that, sir. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, item number seven, uh, Chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. 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 Been moved and second to adjourn. We are adjourned.